Hello and welcome to today's episode of NHM Live, Who's Afraid of the Dark? Today's show is inspired by our latest museum exhibition, Life in the Dark, which opens this Friday, Friday 13th of July, but I was lucky enough to get a sneak peek of it earlier and it's brilliant. Chock-a-block full of museum specimens from all over the world and it's full of immersive experiences like bat caves, the deep sea and nocturnal landscapes. And that's what we're going to be talking about today and specifically the different ways that mammals are adapted to survive and navigate in a nocturnal world. And I'm going to be joined by two experts today that will delve into the darkness with me and here to answer your questions because we are very much live. Uh, so send in any questions or comments that you have and we will get through as many as we can. Right, Steph, thank you so much for joining us today. Who's afraid of the dark? I know you're not because nope. actually you're a, a <laughs> nocturnal, well, uh, you're an ecologist here at the museum and you spend a lot of time in the shadows <laughs> surveying at night times for all sorts of animals. Yeah. Um, perhaps you could start by bringing the nocturnal world to life to us a bit. What is it all about? What, what's going on in a nocturnal landscape? Okay, so mostly um, I'm out and around um, doing bat surveys, uh, which means sitting um, outside in the dark as it gets darker and then listening for, for bats. And you start to realise when you're doing that actually how much life there is out there in the dark. Mm. Um, even in you know, quite urban areas in, in Britain, you can find an awful lot of wildlife um, out and around. Um, but obviously we're not particularly well adapted to find it. Um, so as particularly our vision starts to go, as light starts to go, you start to realise that these creatures are finding their way around the landscape using different senses. They might be using touch, smell, um, but predominantly you start to think about sound quite a lot because you hear quite a lot of um, animals out and about in the dark. And it's very hard for us to imagine or experience what it must be like for a nocturnal world for these animals that are adapted to it because it's quite alienating mm -hmm. isn't it you know we suddenly feel a bit lost but one of the things we do here as you said is sounds um what does a, a uk uh, nocturnal landscape sound like what are the sort of things that people might hear oh, so there's there's all sorts of animals that can be out there from from badgers snuffling past you um to yeah uh, various different mammals birds and things like that out there as well we've got a few things we're going to put you put you to the test a little bit so okay. this is the sound that most people associate often with a nocturnal world. Let's let's have a listen to this first. I love that sound. It's a great sound, isn't it? So I hope, I'm sure most of you would have heard that. What, what exactly? It's an owl, obviously, but what type of owl are we? So it's a tawny owl. Okay. Um, so it's a species you find quite often in woodlands, um, quite wooded areas. Um, some people might be, even be lucky enough to hear it from their back gardens if they live in a fairly rural area. Now that's, uh, that's a sound we'd often associate with woodland, but actually even in urban areas, there are nocturnal mammals that we often hear. Sometimes they can be a little bit annoying. We've got another <laughs> sound that some of you might be familiar with that we're gonna play as well, and you can tell us what this is. Sure. I've been kept awake a few times by it. Yeah. What, what's yeah. this? It's thing? quite a recognisable sound again. So that's a fox. Um, not necessarily all that popular with, with everyone, particularly if it is keeping you awake at night. Um, but definitely a recognisable sound, even if it does give you a little bit of a jump if you uh, suddenly hear it. And why is, why is the fox making that sound? It's territorial. Okay. So it's making its presence known. So that's the, the owl and the fox, the two things we're quite familiar with, mm -hmm. but then there are other sounds that you hear. We're going to play something which people probably might have heard, but maybe not know what it is. So let's play it now. Um, <laughs> it, almost sound, it almost doesn't sound like an owl. Yeah. It's like a small sting train. Yeah. <laughs> so what's that? Uh, so that's actually a hedgehog okay. um, huffing past. So it's a actually one, yeah, it's one of my favourite things to actually find out on a bat survey if you're sat there and maybe it's a little bit of a quiet bat survey and suddenly a little hedgehog um, appears. Um, but yeah, it's a great little sound. Not one that people would perhaps think the hedgehog no. makes. And we don't hear as many as we used to. No, now. Not. Um, and without sight. As I said before, it can be a bit alienating, we, we confusing what they are. But now that you've heard a few, we're going to put you to the test. I'm going to play a sound now, another nocturnal sound. I want you guys to send in your suggestions of what you think it is. And no prizes, unfortunately, other than the wonderful feeling when you know that you're right. But the first person to get it right will we'll, we'll give a shout out to. So let's play it now and, and you can send us what you think it might be. Okay, that's all we're going to give you. We're going to cut. All right, so send us in your uh, suggestions and we'll get through them. But Steph, there are some sounds that are beyond what humans can hear. Yeah. Now, most famously, that's 
stats. Um, so to find out more, we actually caught up with Ken Greenway from Tower Hamlets Cemetery Park in search of some of London's bats. Here's how I got on. Hi Ken, thank you so much for agreeing to show us around Tower Hamlet Cemetery Park. Feels like the perfect place to be looking for bats, not just because of all the graves that are everywhere, yeah. but it's a wonderful space for nature. It's a local nature reserve, isn't it? How long has it had that sort of status? So we've been a local nature reserve since 2001 and a public park since 1966, but historically a cemetery um, from 1841 up until our closure in 1966. Lovely, and it's a perfect sort of refuge sanctuary in the middle of, you know, quite an urban area of London. It's the last place you sort of expect to see bats in some ways. Um, what are we actually likely to see tonight? We're most likely to see pipistrels. About 90% okay. of all bats you see in the UK tend to be a pipistrel. And they're, they're quite small, aren't they? They're the smallest of the British bat species, so they weh as much as a sheet of A4 paper. All right, And um, with their wings closed, they'll fit into a regular small matchbox. OK. But they're, they're all, our, all British bats eat insects, and a pipistrel will eat approximately 3,000 mosquitoes in a single night. Wow, I got stung by quite a few last night, actually, yeah. so I'm quite pleased to hear yeah. that, to be honest. And how how do you know, you say sort of pipistrel, how would you know, obviously it's dark and you normally only see a flash flying around, yep. how can we tell it's a pipistrel? So, so with many of our bat species they come out at different points as sunset hits, so pipistrels tend to be one of the first to emerge, you'll yeah. see them at, at kind of dusk, yeah. um, and other bat species come out once it's dark. Also they have distinctive flight patterns, so a pipistrel often flies in a distinctive figure of eight pattern, Okay. Um, but then you'll, so you've got kind of just being able to recognise animals and, yeah. and get a feel for them, like the jizz of things, they say. If, like birds. Like birds. Yeah, yeah. Um, but also we back that up with a bat detector. OK, so, so, that sounds fancy. So, so bat detectors I like to describe as like a radio. They tune into the frequency that we can't hear and turn it into audible sound. Fantastic. So because bats echolocate above the above the range of human hearing mm -hmm. and they use that to orientate themselves in a landscape and to hunt. Can we, um, have we got any examples of the sort of sounds that we're going to yeah, be listening yeah. so for later got, on? So, so I've got a, a Bluetooth speaker here. Excellent. And uh, so, and I've got an app on my phone that we can listen to some bat sound on. So the, the, the app's called Batlib and it lists all the major north, sort of northern European species. So, um, so this is what hopefully we're going to hear later. This is what we're here on a bat detector. Right. So uh, it's kind of thinking about what the sound is like. Is it wet? Is it dry? Fast? Slow? All okay. those kind of things. Um, but, you know, it can be quite difficult if you're not used to kind of describing sound. Yeah. Um, but anyway, let's play let's the pipistrel strill and listen for the raspberry because that will tell us that the bat's eaten something. OK. <laughs> now it's like I'm no expert, yeah. but that sounded a bit wet yes. and quite a, like a sort of fast rhythm. Yeah, that so people describe, describe a pipper straw as a wet smack okay. or a wet slap. So, Lovely. you know, it, I often say to when we do bat walks with children, I say, look, if you ever want to be a bat and get away with making a mess in the bath, yeah. just do this really quick in the bath and then you get told off by your parents and just say, no, but I'm being a bat. It's all for science. And then you can blow a raspberry. And then you can blow a raspberry at your parents <laughs> as well. So. so, yeah, the conditions seem right. You know, we've started seeing lots of insects flying around. Um, there's nothing for it. Let's go and see what we can find. Yeah, let's go. All Excellent. right. Which here. way? This way? Yep. Perfect. There it comes. I've got there it, it is. I've above got it us. Where? It's above our head. There it is. In the trees. There it is, just above our head. Ah, fantastic. It's, it's echolocating really quietly. There it is. It's just doing circles yeah. around us. What? So what frequency? Th this is another common pipistrel, but it, it's not shouting very loudly, so it does sound far away. As it gets darker, the echolocation will come louder. There it is. It's still there, flying. It's still around. there, but it's. There it goes. Oh, fantastic. Oh, that's there we brilliant. Go. What's great is you hear it first, don't you? Yeah, so it's like, yeah, where is it? it? Where is it? And then and you, then have you to get your eyeballs on it. You saw it very quickly. Yeah. It's quite funny because there's still crows flying around. There are. So yeah. sort of, are they at risk at all? Here it comes. Oh, right over right ahead. Over ahead. Did you see that? Yeah, it's, it's flying uh, just around there. Yeah. Okay, Kent, we definitely got a pipistrel. There's still one flying around, I think. We didn't get a noctual. It's, it's pretty hard to see them, but I guess that's why we got the bat detectors. Exactly, you know, our eyes get really rubbish when it gets dark and these bat detectors bring the night sky to life and we're able to enjoy the true stars of the night sky, our flying mammals, the bats. It's been brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing them it's with us. It's been my pleasure. Thanks for visiting. 
Right, now, even though we didn't see as many bats as we would have liked, it was so much fun. So thank you again to Ken for showing me around Tower Hamlet's Cemetery Park. Steph, uh, bat walks, going looking for bat surveys, important, but really fun. I, it was yeah. genuinely exciting. It's, yeah. it's a real thrill, isn't it? It really is, and it, I, it never really gets old for me. No. Yeah, I genuinely enjoy it every time, because you never quite know what you're going to come across. Exactly. Um, right, well, what was, what was interesting was obviously to see the bat detectors in action, but it'd be good to actually learn a little bit more about how these bats are echolocating. Mm -hmm. Now, is it something that all bats do? So all bats in the UK echolocate, mm. but not all bats in the world. So there's about 900 species in the world and about half of them echolocate, um, but certainly all the ones in the UK do. Okay. Um, and how what are they what are they using it for i mean we, we heard there about the feeding of raspberry what's the main reason yeah. that that's so they're using, so they're using it basically to build up a picture of what's around them okay. uh, so they're using sound to to build up what's in front of them what hazards there are what food is available all these right. sorts of things it builds up a very detailed picture but using sound and it's literally just bouncing back off yeah. whatever it is yeah. is that how it works which sounds very simple it sounds a very simple concept throwing a sound out and listening for for it to come back to you sounds like it's very simple but actually when you look in detail at what the call is composed of these calls can be quite complex okay. are very very fast and provide an awful lot of information and they manipulate the sound quite a lot depending on what's going on around them too okay like all things the more you look the more complex you realize yep, it is definitely. now if you guys have got any questions about bats echolocation or even if you want to test Steph with some other questions, uh, do send them our way. Um, and we've got some wonderful footage of actually bats in slow motion. We must say thank you to, to Aaron Cor uh, Corcoran for his wonderful footage. Uh, we're gonna show a bat in slow motion and you can actually hear the echolocation um, as well and see it as well if you look closely. Let's take a look. Now this is really slowed down, but if you look closely enough, you can actually see the bat's mouth opening yeah. and the echolocation coming out. Yes, yeah, you can. Now that's a, sort of a very steady rhythm there. Uh, do they always echolocate out of their mouth? So most bats do echolocate out of the mouth. It's called cool produced through the mouth. There's actually two groups of bats which don't. Um, the old world fruit bats uh, echolocate through the nose, as do our um, horseshoe bats, our two species of horseshoe, which is why they've got that very strange looking face with the very complicated nose leaf, because they use the shape of their nose to manipulate the sound. Um, oh God, it's yeah, it's not going to win any beauty contest, but it's, it's a very important feature that it's got. <laughs> yes. um, and the pitch is incredibly high. How are they? And, and they're also doing it really loudly. It's almost yeah. good that we can't hear it because it would be no, you'd go out for a walk and it would just be noise everywhere. Some back calls can be extremely loud. I think up to about 120 to 150 decibels, which would be like having a smoke alarm going off, I think about 10 centimetres from your ear. So they can actually <laughs> manipulate the, it, their ear bones so they don't damage their own hearing. Oh, so yeah, so it is just yeah. as well we can't hear because yeah. it would be it would be very noisy. Um, how can they generate such power then as their, as their echo? So because it's, it takes quite a lot of energy to actually produce the sound, a lot of the general navigational calls can be made by compressing the lungs with the wing beats. So mm. the, w the, the actual motion of the wings um, actually slightly compresses the lungs and that forces and, and helps the sound to come out. So that they're being quite efficient in that way with their the normal commuting navigational calls. But they can, so they've got a steady rate, but they can change it to make it yes. more accurate, can't they? Yeah, yeah. So we heard on the film um, out at Tower Hamlets, this uh, feeding raspberry or feeding buzz. And we've got um, a slowed down version of it as well. Mm. And it's stunning footing, it yeah. footage again from Aaron where we see uh, the myotis bat, I think, yes, in I action. Think one, yeah. uh, let's take a look at that now. Great footage. It's brilliant. And obviously it sort of stops echolocating while it's munching on the moth or whatever it might be. Mouse is full. <laughs> <laughs> so you can hear it, it, it increasing frequency. Now what, the yeah. other thing you notice straight away is how they're using their wings yeah. to actually collect the bat. Yeah. Is that what all bats do when they're catching insects? So some do, not all. Um, it depends on what they're catching. Uh, some bats are particularly well known for using the tail membrane to catch and to carry uh, their prey off as well. Um, but the call there was very interesting to hear, that, that real sped up, um, basically echolocation in high definition yeah. is what they're going for there. And 
the other thing you know is incredible acrobatics as well they're able to do yeah. to eat on the wing uh, but with with these bats sort of essentially just shouting really loudly all the time can the insects not hear them coming at all they're not tuned into this? some can yes so some moths particularly have adapted to be able to hear um, bat echolocation calls and respond accordingly um, so you will see all, all manner of adaptations in this predator-prey arms race uh, between different groups of bats. Um, in the UK, it's probably best known with, between the brown long-eared bat and uh, the yellow underwing, which is its favourite food. Okay. Um, and I think we've got a clip of the oh, brown, brilliant. brown long-eared in action. Yeah, sorry, carry Excellent. on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, what the, what the uh, yellow underwing moth will do if it hears a bat echolocation call, particularly if it hears a feeding buzz, it'll collapse its wings and crash to the floor to just duck out of the way of okay. the bat. Um, so it just avoids the bat completely. Wow. But what you can see there is, it, and you can see it really nicely, but you can see he did catch it. And the, um, the bat there has actually evolved its echolocation call to be really quiet so it can sneak up now on these moths that can hear it. So it's, it, its other name, the brown long eared, is, is the whispering bat because it has this very quiet call. Um, so you can it's see sort of the stealthily sneaking up stealth bat. bat. Yeah, but you can see the other adaptation. Therefore, is its gigantic ears. They're about two thirds the length of the body. They do look quite ridiculous, I have to say. But that's so it can hear its very quiet call. Okay, well. so it's sneaking up. It's being very quiet, but it needs these massive ears to detect that echolocation coming yeah. back. And we've got one um, other brilliant piece of footage as well, which is another yeah. moth, which is, is which actually sort of sonar jamming as well, yeah. isn't it? Tell us about yeah. this, I couldn't believe it. So yeah, so there's, there's multiple different adaptations that moths have come up with. We've just seen avoidance. Um, in some cases, they can physically adapt to baffle sounds, so they actually start to manipulate the bat's call. In this case, um, it's actually jamming um, the bat's call, so it misses the bats, so the moths can actually create a sound themselves, which can either be a warning to say, I taste terrible, in the way that maybe bright colours would do for an animal in, a, um, in the daylight. Um, bats can actually, sorry, moths can actually produce a sound which confuses and jams the bat signal too. Amazing. So as it's, as it's sort of sneaking up on it, it's like an air horn, like yeah. right at the last second and the bat has no yeah, idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's incredible. Do they not get confused, the bats, if, if they're all echolocating at the same time? How can they hear their own voice amongst all the noise? So they will manipulate their calls, so you'll find that they, they might be echolocating at slightly different frequencies, so they yeah. can hear their own voices. Much like being in a crowded room, you can generally pick up your own voice. So they've, right. they've got, yeah, they can, they can alter so they, their can calls. Can they be like, oh, that's Steve over there, I think he's got a moth. Maybe. <laughs> 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 might be anthropomorphising a little bit there, but perhaps. Um, but certainly they do modify their calls, so e each one's echolocating at perhaps a slightly different frequency or slightly wow. different rate. So actually our bat detectors are only giving us this mm. crude sort of average yeah. that we're hearing of the, yeah, the frequency yeah, yeah. that we, they're we, echolocating. Yeah, when we talk about specific frequencies, we are very much oversimplifying when we're doing that. Amazing. Super. And that footage, I can't get over just seeing them. You know, they're, they're such impressive animals, yeah. aren't they? Absolutely. But... Um, Echolocation is one sort of nifty trick the bats have, but there are many more that mammals have, sensory adaptations to allow them to navigate in a nocturnal landscape. And we asked uh, Louise Thompson, a senior curator here at the Museum of Mammals, to select some features from different mammals that she would put together if she was going to create a perfectly adapted uh, nocturnal mammal. Here's what she had to say. These are some of the sensory features I would choose if I were to create the perfectly adapted nocturnal mammal. OK, let's start with the eyes. To us, the nocturnal world is all about darkness, and we're not very well suited to seeing in the dark. But there are plenty of nocturnal mammals that can see very well. Owl monkeys, for example, have very large eyeballs with spherical-shaped lenses, which absorb lots of light and allow them to see in greater detail at low lights than mammals active during the day. But for our perfectly adapted nocturnal mammal, I think we have to choose the eyes of another primate, the tarsier. They are enormous, the largest eyes of any mammal relative to the size of their head. In fact, each of the tarsier's eyes is the same size as its brain. It means they have superb night vision, but it is a bit of a trade-off as they can only see in black and white. Now, it's also important that our nocturnal mammal has a good pair of ears. Unsurprisingly, many nocturnal mammals have incredible hearing, but I think I would probably have to choose the ears of the fennec fox from North Africa. They may be the smallest of foxes, but their ears are huge, up to half their body length. Feeding at night keeps them out of the heat of the day, 
When hunting, they have the ability to triangulate sound and pinpoint the exact location of insects, rodents, reptiles, and other tasty treats, often hiding just under the sand. So that's hearing and sight covered, but what about smell? There are many noses we could select for our perfect nocturnal mammal, the badger, the fox, even the pale-throated sloth, which can smell whether a branch is dead or not and likely to break. But I'm going to go with a large flying fox. Not a fox at all, but an enormous bat. They not only have a large nose, but the part of the brain used to process smells is also enlarged. They can sniff out fruit from great distances and even follow their noses when finding a mate. So I think it will do nicely. So, if I was going to pick a perfectly adapted nocturnal mammal, I would start with tarsier eyes, then fennec fox ears, and then a flying fox nose. You couldn't go too far wrong with that combination, although you might not win any beauty contest, not that that matters much in the dark. These are only some of the features that nocturnal mammals need to do well in the dark. They possess many other sensory and behavioural adaptations. Perhaps you have some other ideas at home. So there's Louise's idea of what a perfectly adapted nocturnal mammal could look like and all of those specimens that you saw there are actually featured in our exhibition. Now I hope you're enjoying the show so far, please do send in our questions, this is your chance to um, ask them to some of the experts that we have in the museum and beyond. Maybe you want to know a little bit more about bats, where you can find them, how you can perhaps go and, and do some bat walks of your own. Um, so please don't be shy, send us your questions as they come to you. Uh, right, so Louise's um, video there, we, we covered quite a lot of senses, so we've looked at echolocation, and Louise we looked at sight, um, smell and hearing. But one thing we haven't talked about yet is touch. And with that in mind, I'm delighted to welcome to the show Dr. Robin Grant from the, from Manchester Metropolitan University to talk to us about your research today. Robin, thanks so much for coming down. Mm -hmm. You've studied uh, and your work has covered a lot of different sort of sensory adaptations, but you focus very particularly on one feature, whiskers. Let's perhaps start with the basics. What, what, what are whiskers and what are they used for? So whiskers are ultimately hair. They're very similar to the hair on our head. Apart from they tend to be a little bit thicker and they're in a super sensitive follicle and okay. it's this follicle that's really important so that they can sense and touch. Right, so the hair is just a little normal hair, it's the follicle which is the magic isn't it? Yeah. And what's the actual, what's, what information are they gathering, the whiskers? So sitting within this super sensitive follicle there's a little ring of sensors all the way around so when the whiskers are, are moved yeah around the ring they can feel the direction of the movement and how hard the force that it's moving in and then if you think about it something like a rat will have 35 whiskers on each side of its face so it's getting 35 pieces of information and so with just one touch it can take the force and direction information and it can identify a prey item wow. or discriminate a texture wow and your research has involved filming uh, using high-speed cameras and you've actually seen this in action, in slow motion. Um, but before we, it's a bit of a teaser, before we have a look at some of that, we actually had a question come through. Thank you, Alison, on Facebook. And this is a question I'll ask both of you, and it's a, really, it's a really important one, actually. What are the main advantages of being nocturnal? Why not just, you know, bask in the sun like humans do? Why bother coming out at night time? Well, there's a couple of key reasons, really, for it. And one of them, actually, is, is predator avoidance. Certainly from mm. a bat perspective, there are far fewer things that can potentially cause a risk to it um, if it comes out at night. So um, predatory birds and things like that are far fewer at night. And also then there's food out there too. Would that say be the same for some of the animals that you've studied? Yeah, definitely. So it's, it's avoiding disturbance, but also they have amazing food availability yeah. too. So they're able to you know, find all these lovely moths that are around at night time, especially if there's bright lights or, or moonshine, where they're able to you know, att attract the animals that they like to eat. Uh, let's go back to whiskers now. Thank you, Alison, though. Cracking question. Please keep send them in. Or if you wanted to, uh, to guess what that sound was you heard at the beginning, um, then please do guess. Uh, but whiskers, um, what are the most impressive set of whiskers that you've seen, Robin? Uh, so, as well as um, being, you know, we're talking a lot about nocturnal, mm. but it's an adaptation to living in the dark. So, animals that live underwater have amazing whiskers too. So, the best 
whiskers I've seen in terms of whisker length, so the biggest whiskers, have been on the California sea lion. Uh -huh. um, so they have whiskers of up to about 35 centimetres wow. long. <laughs> We've got a picture pretty, there. They are pretty beautiful. mega whiskers. Yeah. <laughs> and that's doing a similar thing, but not in nocturnal environment. It's, it's under the, under, in the ocean, basically. That's it. So they can um, touch mm. different surfaces and, and touch fish, but also they can um, feel the hydrodynamic trail, so the wakes that come off fish, mm. so they're able to, to track them and, uh, and catch them. Superb. And, but the animals that you've been studying, and you've been taking this footage of, much, much smaller. What, um, and, and nocturnal animals as well, what are the advantages and, and where are they most commonly found, the whiskers, on, on the animals that you've been studying? Yes, yeah, so, so all mammals, pretty much almost all mammals, have whiskers. Mm. But in terms of the nocturnal mammals, the, the best whiskers can be found in animals that are small, mm -hmm. um, nocturnal and arboreal, so they're living in the trees. They're living in this really complex environment and they're using their whiskers to explore how they navigate and move around safely in their environment. Okay, and we've got some footage I think we should show. I think the first one is actually finding food, isn't it? And we've got an example. You can talk us through some, some commentary of, of what we're seeing. So part of moving around, of course, and getting around your environment is that you have to find food sources. So this video that you're looking at now is an Etruscan shrew, which is one of the smallest Whoop. mammals, eating a cricket, attacking a cricket. Now, Etruscan shrews are, are tiny. They can fit on a teaspoon, and they're almost the size of that cricket. Wow. And they have to eat about 30 crickets a night and they have to do that really efficiently so what they do in the dark so this is all in pitch black is that they move their whiskers and they feel for these special spines which are on the legs of the cricket wow. and then as soon as they feel that so with one touch they can direct an attack to the leg and then they pull off the leg so they're immobilized and then they can start to attack the thorax and and uh, eat the cricket after that wow so their sensor you know they're, they're, they can feel with enough um, accuracy to know that it's something to eat because there was no hesitation that bam straight on you know it could have been a cat or a dog mm. or something but there was no question at all. yeah it's it's literally just one whisker touch and that they can tell where those spines are they know it's a cricket and they direct their attack to that section brilliant well let's have a look at some more of the footage that you've got which shows how they're being used slightly differently and that's more for for moving around and i think again this is i know this is one of your sort of prime um, animals that you've been studying, the, the dormouse. Let's take a look at this and how they're using their whiskers. So dormice move their whiskers to um, navigate safely around their environment. So when you think they've got to climb around through hedgerows, um, which takes quite a lot of negotiating in the dark. So what they're doing is they're moving their whiskers and touching the branches so that they're able to put their feet safely crossing a gap, they palpate on the other side of the gap so that they ensure face f safe footfalls as they cross over that gap. I mean, you can look at him negotiating a tiny twig here, and it's really, really difficult. So they have to sense kind of all the way around to make sure that they're putting their feet somewhere safely and, and also looking for food at the same time. <laughs> and it's a very complex environment that they're living in, so I guess the more information that they've got about it as soon as possible, you know, it's the difference between them making that jump and, and not making it as well. Yeah, definitely. Now, I don't know if the viewers at home can see, but um, their whiskers are moving, aren't they? They're, they're not sort of just static. And there's a very special word for that, isn't there? What, what are they doing and what's it called? So whiskers move backwards and forwards in a, in a movement that's called whisking. Mm. So something like a dormouse will move their whiskers backwards and forwards at about 10 times per second. Wow. Um, something as small as, um, as a harvest mouse will move their whiskers at about 25 times per second, which is one of the fastest movements that mammals can make. Okay, so that's why you need this high-speed <laughs> camera to, to film it. Yes. Um, we've had a question come in from Chris on Periscope. Uh, this one, I imagine, is probably more for Steph. Um, it, it, they want to know about whether bats existed during the Jurassic period. Good question. When did bats come oh, on the scene? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> I something I have to delve into my memory. Yeah. There are some quite old fossils of bats. Um, I can't remember the exact time period off the top of my head, I, but I will post that one up on Facebook later. Um, I, I, now, this is amazing that I actually might know something. Excellent. Yeah, I think it's about 45 million years ago, which I think is the Eocene 
period. Yeah, but right. what we'll do is we'll I check. Think, I think there's an older one than that. Is there really? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I will need to double check it though. This is, um, these are the so questions we yeah. like, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, yeah ones that we're putting on the spot. But we will go and, and we will double check and we'll yeah. get an answer. But interesting, I know that the echolocation itself doesn't come in until quite a bit later. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. So well, let's flip that uh, to, to whiskers, actually. When do whiskers, when do we think whiskers hit, you know, first appeared on the scene? It's very difficult to tell because um, whiskers aren't preserved in the fossil record, really, so it's very, very difficult to see. Um, we do think, because, um, because basically whiskers have a, have a special muscle system, mm. so every single whisker has, it, has its own muscle. And um, what we do see is that these muscles are preserved from marsupials, um, through to rodents, through to primates. Yeah. So we do imagine that the first uh, mammals would have had movable whiskers, really? um, but it's very hard to see. So we are, a lot of our research at the moment is trying to look through and see if there's anything that we can look at in the skull yeah. in more detail so that we can try and understand whether the first mammals would have had movable whiskers or, or whiskers at all. What sort of clues might we see in, the, in a skull? Um, so the skull themselves, you saw a lovely example earlier of the big eye orbits, but there's also another hole in the skull, which is called the infraorbital foramen. Mm -hmm. So it's through this little hole, which is around here, is where information comes in from the whiskers. So if you have a very big hole there in this infraorbital foramen, which you can see uh, on the rodent skull, uh, then it has a huge hole. It, get, it gets a lot of information from its whiskers. Um, whereas, as you can see from the primate, it's, it's it's very small compared to the size of its eyes. So it's a bit of guesswork, but we can start to piece together these clues looking mm. at their skulls. Oh, we've got a question. We're going to keep on whiskers just temporarily um, from Beef Man Do on Periscope. Thank you for your question, which, I which is, which is best? Lots of short whiskers or a few long ones? I think <laughs> it's a very good question. <laughs> Thank you. I think it very much depends um, what you're using them for primarily. So something like a walrus has loads, they're about 300 uh, whiskers and they're very short and they use them to explore wow, on the seabed and find tasty mollusks to eat so it's a bit like a brush. Yeah. Whereas if you're maybe in a, in a fluid environment like the sea lion then you want to be able to control maybe fewer whiskers and you just want to direct you know 35 or so um, towards a fish and to be able to have the, the length so you're able to touch and then attack so maybe if you're looking at a movable prey item you might want a few longer whiskers whereas if you're kind of exploring for food in, in a kind of sed sedimenty kind of environment okay. you might want few more and stubbier ones. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, well hopefully that answered your question a bit. It's about where you, you live and, and how you, you're using your whiskers. Okay, well we've got lots of questions coming through. Whiskers have obviously sort of tickles people's <laughs> imagination here. Uh, we've got a, a question for, for you, Steph. Okay. Um, so Lucy's husband on Twitter <laughs> wanted to know, so we put up a bat box in our garden two days ago. Great. Do the bats ever breed in these boxes or do they just rest in them? Um, during the day and, and they'll roost somewhere else. Okay, so, so bats can, um, you can get breeding colonies forming in some bat boxes. Yeah. Um, it really depends where you are, um, if what's actually needed in that environment as well, so what they're actually looking for in mm. that environment, but you can get maternity colonies forming in them. Okay. Um, bats can use different types of bat boxes right the way through the year as yeah. well, so if it's more of a crevice type bat box, like a Kent bat box, probably going to be used slightly less for, for breeding that might be useful you know, throughout the year for a few few bats. Yeah. Um, and you can get these huge, get big hibernation bat boxes as well that I have used on sites before um, for, for bats to actually try and overwinter in too. The problem is that the bats don't necessarily know it, it's intended for them. So don't be downhearted if you don't initially get bats there. Keep it up. Yeah. It might even be that a few years time that they'll use it. It can take a while, yeah. um, but you know, bird planting Plants which bring out uh, evening insects as well, you can attract them into your garden, which might increase the chances of the bat box getting taken up too. And I must say as well, um, the Bat Conservation Trust, which very kindly provided us mm. with some of the images today, have got lots of information of how you can attract bats and encourage them as well. Okay, so yeah. do check that out. OK, well, we've got a few more questions coming in. So I'm going to keep sort of going whiskers, bats, whiskers, bats. I'm quite <laughs> enjoying this. So um, we've got a question from Peter on Facebook who wants to know, um, oh no, sorry, uh, from Periscope, wants to know, does my house dog have little use for his whiskers? What is he still using them for? 
<laughs> so this is a really good question. It's a bit of a balance between the senses. So, um, you know, the animals, we were talking about the dot mice and the, and the sea lion and the dark, they're primarily using their whiskers. But with your dog, he's probably primarily using his sense of smell. Yeah. So I think perhaps they might be using their whiskers as they get close to, to something. So I know my, my little dog, she, um, she got a bit blind recently and she seemed to use her whiskers and when she put her head down in her water bowl to work out where her water was so then she could start start drinking but when you think they're so so close to their to their face that they probably don't use them that much anymore okay brilliant uh, like a lot of our questions today there's often a bit more to it than we might imagine <laughs> um we're going to finish off now and i'd like to take a, a look at louise's perfectly adapted nocturnal mammal so we've got the fennec fox ears we've got the tarsier eyes and we've got the the nose from the flying fox beautiful looking thing here <laughs> uh, we should really be adding some whiskers to it as well and echolocation but my there we go just look at that modern <laughs> graphics incredible um but my question to you would such would you ever get such a common combination of all these sensory adaptations or would it be overwhelming you know are they actually using one at a time or could you get five or six sort of different things happening at once so certainly from the perspective of bats, bats don't just use echolocation. Um, they've actually got very good eyesight, um, very, very light sensitive eyesight as well. This whole thing of blind as a bat is, is not a thing. Um, they, so they certainly will switch from vision to echolocation depending on what environment they're in, how light it is outside. Mm. Um, so certainly they've got multiple adaptations and they do have whiskers as well for finding their way um, around when they're inside a roost. Um, they're quite short little whiskers. Um, but for finding the way around when they don't need to echolocate and it's maybe quite dark in a roost. Um, so they do use multiple senses. Certainly. Okay, but maybe they've got sort of one that they, they focus on. Is that tr similar for the work that you've been doing, Robin? Yeah, definitely. It's kind of, they, they use a collection of all their senses mm. and, and it's what makes mammals really so behaviourally flexible. So they're able to do so much because they're able to exploit all these different senses so they can be in lots of different niches um, and lots of different environments. Having said that though, uh, one animal that, um, that can echolocate also has quite good eyes and it has little uh, facial senses too is the oil bird, uh, which is a South American nocturnal bird which can do all of these things as well. So um, yeah, maybe birds have super senses as well. <laughs> okay, right. So it's not just mammals, obviously, is it? Well, unfortunately, we have just about run out of time today. Thank you so much, Robert and Steph, for joining us today um, and answering all the questions that we've had on. Thank you so much for the questions that you've been sending through. If you didn't get your question answered, these guys are going to jump online and answer a few more um, now. Um, if that hasn't quite given you your fill of life in the dark, don't forget the exhibition opens this Friday, Friday 13th, of July and a lot of the animals that we feature including the oil bird actually feature in that exhibition so if you want to learn more about uh, nocturnal adaptations go there now humans don't have some of these adaptations these senses but occasionally we can sense something else and I can sense a sniff on the wind maybe a slight glow on the horizon that maybe just maybe it's coming home right we'll see you guys next time on NHM live <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.